Okay, Naren. Now it's time for uh, Professor Fujimaki, who start, who's going to start his presentation of microvascular decompression for trigeminal neuralgia and hemifacial spasm. Please. Thank you, Dr. Ch <coughs> Thank you, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I really thank for the organizing committee and the NRM for inviting me here. Actually, I'm the only delegate from the uh, Far East, so maybe I'm a little bit jet lagged and after lunch and I might fall asleep, so please wake me up if I fall asleep. All right, so I have nothing to disclose. Okay, um, here the Saitama is, somebody asked me, so I put this slide new here. It's very close to Tokyo and it's just a one hour train ride from Tokyo. So if you just stop by Tokyo, please visit me. And it looks like, like that, so uh, a little bit of mountains in the suburbs. Okay, today I'm gonna talk about the facial pain, trigeminal neurosia, diagnosis, treatment, and also uh, surgery, of course, this is a surgery course. And facial spasm, diagnosis, very easy, but just a little bit, in, including images and also surgery. <laughs> you are all familiar with these structures like a facial nerve, cochlear nerve, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these things should be kept in mind when, because some of my talk will be detailed a little bit more uh, local area in this field. <laughs> Many patients uh, smiling at me after surgery. It's, it's a very, very rewardable surgery, however, there's a light, there's a shadow. It's from the girder and the, the, of course, not all the patients are happy <laughs> like that. This is a paper from United States 2003. All the, it's uh, about 1,600 patients all over the United States for the microvascular decompression. And the mortality is 0.3%, that means Three out of 1,000 patients received this surgery, passed away. And also, discharge other than home, 3.8%. That means there's significant, at least I may say significant, mobility. And also, very recent publish publication in Surgical Neurology International from Barrow Institute and Mexico, they say out of 194 cases, there's a one mortality for hemifacial spasm. Well, so for the microvascular decompression surgery, I think it's very important to do secure technique and procedures to achieve cure for those patient, because we're handling uh, not a uh, life-threatening disease, it's functional disease, and also, we need to avoid complication first, do no harm. And decision should be made by the discussion and the patient should decide themselves after our detailed informed consent. <laughs> About incidence epidemiology in the Western countries, trigeminal neurosia, like uh, five, four cases in 100,000 population in a year, new patient, However, the hemifacial spasm is like one-fifth of those. But in, the, in Japan or Asian countries, it's a reversal. It's, we have more hemifacial patient than trigeminal. Maybe due to skull shape, I'm more round, you're more long. Okay, let's start with the trigeminal neurosia. I often have uh, many referral patients from all over the Japan for, okay, please do surgery for this trigeminal neurology patient. However, it's very important to decide whether you can treat this patient with your surgery or not. Is it really a trigeminal neurology? Is it caused by vascular compression? Or if the anatomy is easy enough no, suitable enough for you to do surgery, it's very important. For example, uh, this report says um, 48 surgery for a trigeminal neurosia, they found vascular compression in surgery in 70% of the patient, and in them, almost 90% of the patient were cured for his, their, their facial pain. However, 
If they don't find any compression or just a contact of the vessel on the trigeminal nerve, that improvement is only 10, 12 percent. That means very important beforehand you do surgery. This is the differential diagnosis of trigeminal neurology. I'm sorry for the busy slides, but if you take a look at these references, you may find this. And actually, there are so many causes that may cause their patient's facial pain. That means very important do diagnosis. For example, uh, JAMA presented a patient page like a trigeminal neurology here, and it describes very detailed symptoms like that. Few seconds to several minutes, the pain should continue. And pain may be triggered, or uh, sometimes they have remission, and et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. They, they, it's very important. But uh, sometimes the patient says, my pain lasts for one hour, two hours. Maybe this patient doesn't have any trigeminal neurology, other pains, but those patients may claim because they have facial pains once few seconds in five minutes and continue one hour. It can happen. Or really continuous pain. So you have to take really nice history taking. Also, um, sometimes they, the patient says, oh, it lasts like five minutes. So I tell the patient, OK, let's start your pain now. OK, how long will it take last? Looking at my watch. and. Actually, it only takes 30 seconds, one, hour, one minute, but still patient thinks it's like five minutes. So it's very important to, to take a nice history of those, pa those patients. Actually, this patient had the uh, left side, no, right side compression, and uh, actually has tri tr typical trigeminal neuralgia, but she had the pacemaker, and I just prescribed carbamazepine, and it was effective. But she came back one or two years later, and it's not effective anymore. But her face is tearing, red eye, and it's a cluster headache. Of course, you cannot treat those patients with carbamazepine or surgery. And this publication from American Association for Neurology uh, 208. This is a very nice paper to read, but I don't have time to detail, to mention detail of this paper, but please remember this paper 208. Okay, other features like never skips V1 and V3, okay? V1 and 2 happen, 2 and 3 happens, 1, 2, 3 happens, but no V1, V3, but be careful about the region this is V2 area, so the, the distribution is very, very uh, uh, mistakeable. All right, how about MRI images? This is a typical trigeminal neurosis. Nerve is bended by the compression. This nerve, so much compressed with the nerve. And this is this side, and coronary image sometimes helps a lot. You may appreciate here, oh, no, I'm sorry. You may appreciate here the uh, trigeminal nerve is compressed by the artery. Uh, but the vaginal compression here, these things are very difficult to handle because sometimes, um, I'm sorry, sometimes the sixth nerve is between vaginal and the uh, trigeminal nerve and it's very difficult to handle those patients. Uh, if you are a beginner in this surgery, I think you'd better send these patients to the uh, old surgeons. Not old enough. Okay. False positive. In some papers, they say 30% of the normal patient without symptoms have contact of artery or vessel and the nerve. Okay, this is a patient. He has a trigeminal nerve. Which side do you think has trigeminal? Right? Anybody left? No, right? Okay. 
Actually, this patient has a left side trigeminal neuralgia. So this is crossing, this is crossing. Very difficult. This patient, if you take a look at here, a little bit bending, and because she had uh, so strong pain, we did surgery, and this tiny vessel compresses here, and I just released it. After surgery, this one. After surgery, it's a little bit straight, and her pain was gone. Fetal somebody called it dandy's vein, is very important. You need to uh, evaluate it beforehand. For surgery, my positioning is like that. Slight head up position, but the head is just horizontal and avoid extreme fixation because of the drainage of the, uh, of the uh, uh, vein, uh, jugular vein. But in elderly patient, please avoid excessive elevation because those patients might have excess CSF drainage and these kind of things are reported by the former surgeons like subdural hematoma, which was mentioned in the sitting position in this morning and also the pneumocephalus complications. ABR monitoring, of course, mandatory. Okay, let's start the surgery. This is a transverse and sigmoid sinus. And a little bit easy to see this way, because uh, this is skull, and emissary vein, and sutures. These can be a nice landmark. Emissary veins, if you open up the posterior part of uh, the patient's head, you will easily find the emissary vein. It's a good landmark. And also sutures, of course. And for craniotomy, you need to open very close to the sigmoid sinus. That means this side, maybe you don't need to worry for the opening of the uh, mastoid air cells, but this side, maybe you might open the mastoid air cells. Okay. And if you open the mastoid air cells, what do you do? Actually, I usually do small bony tips will be just close to close the opening and seal with mass wax. And maybe I have several hundreds of patients treated with uh, hundreds with like that, and I've never experienced CS renal air. And Peter Janetta mentioned about always wax mastoid. I agree with him. Dural incision, sigmoid and transverse, T-shaped, and opening it. And my concept is like that. Because uh, SGA separate several artery is the most frequent compressing artery here, you pull to the tentorium with teflon, and then insert the teflon between the fifth and SGA, but move the artery away to avoid contact to the fifth nerve. Horizontal fissure. Sometimes it's, e it's uh, useful if you open it and see it, because it's directly toward the trigeminal nerve. OK, I will show you some of my video. Oops. Yep. Yep. Moving? OK. Dissecting arachnoid, and now uh, already uh, the peritorosal vein was dissected and uh, find the connection between uh, artery and trigeminal nerve and sharply dissected. Now the artery can be mobilized. Okay, and I already pulled the artery to the tentorium. I insert the teflon, and uh, together with teflon, I can move the artery away. And we don't have any contact between artery, teflon, and the uh, nerve. You can insert maybe gel for massage cell between here for, for, for a while. The other surgery, oops. Oh no, it's okay. By the way, the petrosal vein is here, sometimes has two channels. 
and it's very disturbing your visual field. And I don't have any nice video, nice or bad video, which has the bleeding from the petrosal vein, but I saw one from the, these references. And the, this is just a cartoon to, to change because of the, this might be webcasted. I don't have any copyright for, for this person's video, but it's actually disastrous. It's very dangerous. And Peter Janetta mentioned that they can, they can coagulate the petrosal vein in time in his 1999 um, 4,000 4, surgeries paper, Journal of Neurosurgery. And I make a question to him, is it really safe? And he said, it's safe. But be cautious, because some already, some authors, this, some speakers this morning mentioned that. And actually, the petrosal veins have many channels, connections, and you might stop maybe some part because there are networks. However, if you cut here, it's sometimes dangerous, but if you cut here, maybe this drainage can go this and that if you are fortunate. Actually, this is a patient that I cut the petrosal vein. I usually don't do that, but because this is a patient who has a vertebral vagina compression, very, very difficult cases. And I dissected the arachnoid, but the, because, of the, um, because of the very short petrosal vein, I, cannot, I don't think I can manage the vertebral artery with this. So coagulate and cut at this point. That means there's a still a connection, this vein and this vein here. So. Oh yeah, here, this and this. So this will be okay. And another issue is uh, this part of the bone. Sometimes it's protrudes and you, it disturbs your visual field. And I coagulate sometimes the dura, and then you will get a nice visualization, the trigeminal nerve. But if you don't still have a nice vis nice field, you can. You can drill here and have a nice view of the trigeminal nerve. Okay. Um, for the teflon, I use a shredded teflon uh, mixed with this, uh, gelatin powder, uh, which I make by myself here, like uh, cheese cooking, and putting them together to make a thread like that, and use for the moving the arteries. This is a case which is a very disastrous uh, two surgeries. After that, he came to him, to me. He's a 74 years old man, two microvascular decompression, other hospitals, and still he has severe pain. He's a man, and he, when he came to me, he's 30 kilogram, three zero, so thin, he cannot eat at all. And many shredded teflons are inserted between the nerve and artery and so many adhesions. I dissected all of them away, and finally he got a nice, uh, nice uh, now, remission of the wait, next pain. Step is so I don't like this kind of surgery, sinus insert, okay. but I like moving. Oh, I like moving surgery. And I already published it in 1996, don't do inserting, but I did this 2002, that means the previous surgeons, two surgeons did this surgery before, after my publication, I don't like that. Okay, <laughs> move this away. All right, so my series is very limited, only 120 cases, trigeminal, but around 87% of the patient are imp uh, cured, and another nine cases are improved with less medication, and I think it's not so bad but I still have 5% of the patient. It's not really good. Uh, quickly, hemphasia spasm. The diagnosis is very easy, very symptomatic, but you, you should be cautious of the Meiji syndrome and other kind of uh, things, but I don't have time to mention about that. Okay, all right, so MRI is also useful. And MRI, 
I'm sorry, MRA and MRI thin T2 images. I prefer these images, heavy T2 images. And also, coronal images very, very useful. This is so-called supra um, olivary facet. This is the part where the facial numbs comes. So you, you have to find the artery here. So this is the artery which is compressing the exit zone of the real exit zone of the facial nerve. OK, portion is same. AVR is important. And during surgery, if you have some um, AVR worsening, you wait. And then you will come, you will recover, it will recover nicely. But in some cases, I'm doing very well during surgery, but when I just finished my dural closure, suddenly ABL brainstem monitoring flattened. I waited, but didn't recover. Actually, I sometimes it recovers after surgery, so I waited, but it didn't. Anyhow, at the end of my surgery, immediately after surgery, he, he loses like 40 decibels after three years. It recovers, but still 20 degrees or something, this kind of things happens. Abnormal muscle response, somebody says it's useful. And I use this sometimes, uh, often, but not always. Position is same. Is the microphone working? OK. Yes, all right. And this is a part which I opens. And this is the occipital bone, and this is C1. And sometimes vertebral artery is very close to here. Should be cautious about that. And the same thing. Dural incision is like this, the reversal to the trigeminal. And retractor, it's very important to retract it for the cranial, not for the lateral to medial, because it pulls your uh, eighth nerve away. And also, if you were to use the uh, spatula, should be here uh, before the, uh, no, not deeper than the choroid plexus, because deeper than choroid plexus, we will have a cochlear nucleus and will be damaged. And you might experience sometimes here is the oozing of the tiny, tiny vessel in the arachnoid close to the lower cranial nerves. Don't use bipolar, use surgical cell because you might damage the lower cranial nerves. Lear Exit zone is here. This is ninth. This is, no, I'm sorry. This is ninth. This is seventh. Crocus under the Crocus. It's here. OK? So my concept is moving artery away from the, this portion. You don't need to touch here. This is uh, surgery. Oops. Very, this is a very easy case. You elevate the artery. Insert a uh, teflon and move together with teflon and the artery. That's it. A very simple case. A little bit complicated case, but uh, not so difficult. Because of the time, I'm a little bit skip it. But be careful about these tiny branches from this artery. If you damage it, you might encounter with facial palsy or hearing disturbances. Uh, arachnoid adhesion can be sharply dissected and elevated with teflon materials. OK. Two teflon, and finally, like that. And this is a patient where the, oh, I'm sorry. Because my time was 30 minutes originally, so maybe I can use another two minutes. <laughs> okay. Is that right? Okay. <laughs> okay. Dissect here. And endoscope sometimes have goes here the vertebral artery and here the another one more artery here. So endoscope helps. So just moving vertebral artery is not enough in these cases. So you move under microscope, both of them together. With teflon.
and then elevate. Sometimes I use tiny Teflon. Oh, yeah, you should be careful about these branches. Okay, this is a drawing of my this procedure. Vertebral artery and one more artery are mobilized, and the Teflon can be inserted between brainstem and the artery, but not on here. And these tiny vessels should be carefully managed. Dural closure, I usually use uh, fascia graft. And fascia you harvest initially here from the sub-Q when you open the skin incision. And please remain one layer for the sub-Q and for muscle to close. And here the uh, closure. And I recently used uh, polyethylene glycol uh, uh, glue and bone fixed with thread and absorbable plate. That means later on, they don't have any uh, plates, uh, tightening plates, and etc. And after like a six months, the bone will be fixed. A little bit tiny fragment might be absorbed, but this will be OK. So hem facial spasm, I did like 800, 900 cases. And the morbidity, I lost four cases for their hearing. Varigo, one case, lower cranial nerve, four cases, and sub-Q uh, CSF accumulation in two cases, and I need another surgery for those cases. And after that, I use polyethylene glycol glue, and I don't have any another sub-Q accumulation in another uh, for three, four hundred cases. And the cure rate is 92 percent, not enough, but. This is one year follow up. Some patient, their hem facial spasm goes after two years, sometimes three years. So this rate should be better. So I really thank for my patient who decided themselves to receive my surgery. And also my team, uh, previous surgeons, and also there are some exchange student, my student, but uh, my team. And I really thank for my uh, teacher. I learned this keyhole surgery with the Takanori Fukushima. And the, it's back to 1990. I received the certificate. And also, I had a chance to eat a dinner together with Peter Janitor, also 1989. And I'm really sorry for his passing two years ago. With that, I'm closing my talk, and I'm happy to accept, accept your questions. Thank you very much, Professor Fujimaki, for this uh, nice presentation on functional neurosurgery. One question. Thank you for the talk. Have you ever proceeded to surgery for a patient with classic um, clinical symptoms and signs, but there is no um, radiological evidence. Yeah, actually, um, I'm recent, maybe I, I, I need to mention about the MRIs. Um, because I'm, when I was working with the Professor Fukushima back to 1990s, um, we don't have nice MRIs at that age. Yeah. And uh, that occasion, sometimes, not frequently, but we encounter the patient, which has a typical trigeminal neuralgia, but they don't have a, uh, any vascular contact at all. Recently, in my series, uh, with nice MRI, I usually do surgery only for those patients who have a typical symptom, typical MRI, and so on. But, but some patient, the symptom is really you know, between border, not really typical, but Maybe it's trigeminal, but maybe not. And the MRI is not typical. But if the patient says, because my pain is so awful, I don't, I, I don't like this high amount of carbazepin, I do several surgeries. And some patient, they have like a tiny contact. Some patient, they don't at all. That happens. And have, right. uh, and have you ever encountered intraoperatively there is not, there's nothing. That means there's no compression. That, that means recently, 
I only do surgery for the patient who has a very typical MRI images and only, typical symptoms. And those cases, I don't think I have ever, ever encountered those patients recently. Have you encountered something that maybe there is an adhesion band, fibrous band? Of course, it, the, the, the tiny case like that. And I also experienced another case in which the vascular contact is not so strong. I just dissected the arachnoid and the vascular uh, supracerebral artery goes away. But there's also a, 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 a arachnoid adhesion and I cut both of them. Right. And the patient uh, trigeminal, looks like trigeminal neuralgia gone. Yeah, that kind of things happens. Thank you. Um, the pain is caused by venous compression rather than arterial compression. Um, I have a case which is not included here, which, who had a uh, very big uh, venous anomaly in the cerebellum, and his symptom is like a sunk. Uh, I can't remember the fact is the abbreviation, is a tearing and kind of things. But because his pain was so strong, I did the surgery, but the usual vein cannot be divided in these cases. Uh, you know, you cannot coagulate it. And the vein cannot be mobilized that way a lot. So I just dissected between the huge vein and the artery, no, uh, the nerve, and the inside the gel form kind of stuff though there, but the symptom didn't improve at all. Maybe it is because of the venous anomaly in the brain stem that causes a symptom, or I didn't do good surgery. And also, in some cases, I do uh, surgery for the patient with uh, vascular com uh, arterial compression. And if I saw venous compression also, if it is tiny, I coagulate those veins. But I'm not sure if, which is the real cause of these patients. But solely venous compression, I never experienced, except for those venous anomalies. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's time to close the session.